deep in the heart of Texas, there's a bird so numerous, so ubiquitous, that a group of them is called a plague. Seriously, look it up. When I was growing up in Southeast Texas, I would often see these black iridescent birds flying through the sky, or perching on power lines, or pooping on my car. You know, typical bird stuff. But if you had asked me then what that bird was called, I couldn't have told you. Today, I do know its name, and as I've learned more about this Texas bird, I've come to find that the story of the great-tailed grackle is not as typical as you might think. It all begins with animal sacrifice. Just imagine for a second, you're a Spanish missionary in 1500s Mesoamerica. While you're there, you see all sorts of new things. Cities more magnificent than any in Europe. Plants and animals completely foreign to you. And oh yeah, those same animals being thrown into a fire. Sadly, I'm not making that up. In his general history of the things of New Spain, Spanish missionary Sahagún wrote about this ceremony. When the fire had been made, when it grew bright on the land, the old men were spread about casting them into the fire. All the birds, Akatsanatol, Teotzanatol, all of them into the fire. Yikes. But more importantly, he goes on to state that one of these birds did not originate in Aztec territory, stating, in the time of the ruler Awitzotl, Teotzanatol appeared here in Mexico, for he commanded that they be brought here. But when they multiplied, they traveled everywhere. If anyone stoned them, the common folk said to one another, what are you doing over there? Do not stone the Lord's bird. The Lord being referred to here is Emperor Awitzotl, and because he was seen as a god, the name Teotzanatl, or Divine Grackle, was given. I'm sure you can guess which grackle we're talking about. The great-tailed grackle is one of six members in the genus Quiscalus, which derives its name from the common grackle, Quiscula, coined by the father of taxonomy himself, Carl Linnaeus. You know, he's that guy who came up with the whole genus species thing. Although Quiscalus is not the only genus of grackle, it is the only monophyletic one, which means that all six Quiscalus species share an ancestor with each other that they do not share with the other species of grackle, of which there are four. To state it differently, grackles are a paraphyletic group. These four grackles are most closely related to these blackbirds, and these six grackles are most closely related to these blackbirds. This concept of paraphyly will return later in the video. But for now, let's take a look at what makes this grackle so great. It's the tail! In general, the great-tailed grackle is the largest species of grackle, with females being quite a bit smaller than the males. There's also a difference in color, and importantly for this video, tail length. While these dissimilarities aren't on the level of, say, a peacock, they are nonetheless quite noticeable. So why does this striking divide in tail length and size exist? It all comes down to sex. You see, great-tailed grackles are socially polygynous, meaning one, they live in colonies, and two, the males usually have multiple mates and the females usually only have one mate. Sorry, ladies. For a male to attract a female, he must utilize one of two strategies. Either acquire territory and attract the females to that territory, or try to mate with females without having a territory. As with humans, the latter is not as effective. A 2000 study in behavioral ecology showed that males who had acquired a territory sired 84% of a colony's nestlings, and that larger males were more likely to acquire a territory in the first place. This can help explain why males of the species are so much larger than the females, but what about tail length? Well, that same study showed a positive correlation between the tail length and the number of females a male breeds with. So over time, males with longer and longer tails were naturally selected for. This sexual selection can account for the massive difference between males and females that we see today. This omnivorous species will eat practically anything, from seeds to berries to lizards to human garbage. They also eat a lot of insects, and in one field study they were observed eating dead bugs off of automobiles. This behavioral flexibility has been tested in the lab as well. A 2016 study in Pier J sought to discover how behaviorally flexible the great-tailed grackle truly was. The experimenter discovered that the birds could learn and unlearn associations quickly, and that they could be taught to drop stones down a tube to retrieve a food reward. Clever girl. They also have a wide range of vocalizations, and if you've been around these birds, you know that they have a flair for the well oysterous.
Currently, the great-tailed grackle has a vast distribution with people hearing this racket far and wide. But it hasn't always been this way. Although the earliest historical evidence of the great-tailed grackle exists within the writings of Sahagun, genetic evidence suggested that it emerged from their gracular brethren sometime in the early Pleistocene before 2 million years ago in Mexico. We know this because, by 2 million BCE, the great-tailed grackle lineage had already split into two genetically isolated groups, the western great tails and the eastern great tails, divided by the Sierra Madre Occidental mountain range. Then, about 1.2 million years ago, in what is now the Valley of Mexico, a marsh-loving species of grackle would diverge from the western great tails, the slender-billed grackle. It had a very limited range and is thought to have gone extinct sometime in the early 20th century. Following this divergence, the two allopatric, or geo geographically isolated groups of great-tailed grackle would remain in their respective halves of Mexico until roughly 800,000 years ago, when some enterprising eastern great-tails would branch off into what is now the United States. Likely separated by the rest of the eastern great-tails by glaciation events in the late Pleistocene, this new population would evolve into the boat-tailed grackle, which can now be found in marshy habitats along the U.S. Gulf Coast and Atlantic Coast. For nearly a million years after this split, the two main great-tailed grackle lineages remained separate. But starting in the 20th century, changes in agricultural practices allowed the once tropical species to expand into the southwestern United States. The eastern and western lineages of the great-tailed grackle would eventually become reunited here in the southwest, where they interbreed freely to this day. And despite being separated for two million years, they are both considered members of the same species. But new research complicates this a bit. Genetic evidence tells us that, despite being the same species, the eastern great-tailed grackle is more closely related to the boat-tailed grackle than it is to its western counterpart. Similarly, the western great-tailed grackle is closer genetically to the extinct slender-billed grackle than it is to the eastern great-tail. Doesn't that make the great-tailed grackle a paraphyletic species? This odd situation where half of a species is more closely related to another species than it is to the other half of its own species kind of makes you wonder about the very definition of species. Can there even be a paraphyletic species at all? Surprisingly, yes. One common definition of species is known as the biological species concept, which defines a species as a population of organisms that breed with each other but not with those outside the population, thus becoming reproductively isolated. A 2008 paper in the ornithological journal The Condor argues that because the eastern and western halves of the great-tailed grackle population interbreed freely where their ranges now overlap, and because the boat-tailed grackle rarely breeds with the eastern great-tailed population where their ranges now overlap, the biological species concept applies. That being said, hybrids do occur between the great-tailed and bow-tailed grackles, which kind of muddies the waters a bit. I guess this goes to show that the natural world will always defy our definitions. Today, the great-tailed grackle reigns over much of North America, Central America, and even South America. Its adaptability in the face of human expansion and climatic chaos has allowed it to spread further than any other grackle, and these qualities make one truly understand why the Aztecs called it the divine grackle. You know, I've lived in the Lone Star State all my life, and just knowing that I get to live beside such fascinating creatures makes me proud to call Texas home. I'm Evan with Evan's Wildlife. Thanks for watching. Thank you.